Hey, what's up Nexus crew and welcome back. Today, we'll be traveling into the past to take a look at some of the worst the Wild West has to offer. Because serial killers aren't just a phenomenon confined to the 20th and 21st century. The Old West was a well-known time of lawlessness, so it's no surprise that there were many active serial killers stalking the prairies and deserts of North America. Boone Helm was born in Lincoln County, Kentucky, into what was considered an honest, hard-working, and respected family. Helm delighted in demonstrating feats of strength and agility, such as throwing his bowie knife into the ground and retrieving it from a horse at full gallop. In one demonstration of his contempt for authority, Helm, on horseback, rebuffed a sheriff's attempt to arrest him by walking his horse up the stairs of a courthouse and into the courtroom while the circuit court was in session, where he proceeded to verbally harass the judge. In 1851, Helm married 17-year-old Lucinda Francis Browning in Monroe County and fathered a daughter, Lucy. He became known for his heavy drinking, riding his horse into the house, and beating his wife. The domestic violence grew to such an extent that Lucinda petitioned for divorce. Helm's father paid for the costs. Having bankrupted his father and ruined his family's reputation, Helm decided to move to California in search of gold. For the journey to California, Helm asked his cousin, Littleberry Shute, to accompany him. Shute initially agreed, but when he attempted to back out of the trip, an angered Helm murdered him by stabbing him in the heart and headed west alone. He was pursued and captured by Littleberry's brother and friends, but his antics in captivity quickly landed him in a mental asylum. Upon entering the asylum, Helm became taciturn and convinced his guards to take him on walks through the woods. After these walks became routine, Helm was able to escape. Once again, traveling west to California, Helm murdered several men in various altercations. Forced to flee to avoid arrest and vigilante justice, he teamed up with six men, to whom he confided that he had eaten all or part of his murder victims. An attack by Native Americans on the way to Fort Hall forced Helm and his party into the wilderness. Short on provisions, the men killed their horses, ate the meat, and made snowshoes out of the hides. The journey was arduous, reducing the party down to Helm and a man named Burton. When Burton could go no further, Helm left him, only to return in time to hear Burton taking his own life with a pistol. Helm ate one of Burton's legs and wrapped the other to take with him on his journey. Helm was finally discovered by a man named John W. Powell at an Indian camp. Powell agreed to let Helm accompany him to Salt Lake City, Utah, but despite having over $1,400 in coins on his person, Helm reportedly neither paid nor thanked Powell for his generosity. Upon reaching San Francisco, Helm killed a rancher who had befriended him and taken him in. He then traveled to Oregon and resumed robbing people for a living, frequently killing them. In 1862, after heavily drinking, Helm gunned down an unarmed man named Dutch Fred in a saloon and fled. While on the run, Helm ate another fugitive who had been accompanying him. Captured by the authorities, Helm implored his brother, Old Tex, one of Helm's twelve siblings, for assistance. With a considerable amount of money, Old Tex paid off all the witnesses. Unable to convict Helm, the authorities released him and he accompanied his brother back to Texas. Helm soon reappeared at many of the settlements mentioned before, killing more men in the process. He was finally apprehended again in Montana. After teaming up with the notorious Henry Plummer and his gang, Helm and four other gang members were captured, arrested, and tried in secret. At trial, Helm kissed the Bible and then proceeded to perjure himself, accusing three-fingered Jack Gallagher, Helm's close friend and fellow gang member, of the crimes Helm himself had committed. The Montana vigilantes hanged Helm, Gallagher, and the other members of the gang in Virginia City, Montana on January 14, 1864, in front of a crowd of 6,000. Upon seeing his friend Gallagher hanged, Helm reportedly remarked, Kick away, old fellow. My turn next. I'll be in hell with you in a minute. When the executioner approached Helm, he allegedly exclaimed, Every man for his principles. Hurrah for Jeff Davis. Let her rip. And then jumped off the hangman's box before it could be kicked away. 
Boone Helm is buried in Boot Hill Cemetery, Virginia City. John Wesley Hardin killed his first man when he was just 15 and went on to kill as many as 44 as a gunfighter and outlaw in the Wild West during the late 19th century. A gentlemanly gambler who made most of his money betting on horses or dealing in cattle, Hardin left his mark on history as one of the Wild West's most skilled gunmen, killing at least 21 men in duels and ambushes between 1868 and 1877. Hardin himself, however, put that number closer to 44. Of course, a man with that many kills is bound to make some enemies along the way especially if he's got a $4,000 bounty on his head, spends his days gambling and drinking, and takes another man's wife as his lover. Born on May 26, 1853 to John Gibson Hardin and Mary Elizabeth Dixon, Wes Hardin was supposed to be a preacher. His parents named him John Wesley after the founder of the Methodist branch of Protestantism, but it seemed that he wasn't meant for the clerical lifestyle. Hardin witnessed his first murder by the age of eight. By nine, all he wanted to do was join the Confederate Army, and by his account, he committed his first act of violence while he was still in school, stabbing a classmate after a fight over a girl. In 1868, John Wesley Hardin was 15 years old, and this is when he killed his first man. Hardin was wrestling with a former enslaved man who went by the name of Madge, the fight got heated, and they were separated, but Hardin refused to leave with the score apparently unsettled. Saddling up his horse, Old Paint, Hardin overran Maj on the road and accused the man of being a coward. He picked up a stick and began beating Maj with it, and when he ran off, Hardin shot him, not intending to kill the man, but when he caught up to Maj, the freed man was coughing up blood. That's at least how Hardin described the incident. Another version of the event, recorded by a Freedmen Bureau agent, claimed that Hardin shot Mage simply because he stood up for himself. Whatever the truth may be, Hardin's life of crime and violence was only beginning. Officially, Hardin earned a living as a cattleman and a gambler, but for one reason or another, he found himself at odds with a fair number of people, and dozens wound up dead because of it. After the incident with Maj, Hardin fled to his brother's house 25 miles north in Sumter, Texas, where, according to the Texas State Historical Association, he claimed to have killed four Union soldiers who were attempting to arrest him. Three years later, in 1871, he traveled to Abilene, Kansas, and killed seven more people along the way. He also managed to get the draw on the famous marshal Wild Bill Hickok, a feat many attribute to Hardin's unique cross-draw method, keeping his guns in shoulder holsters rather than at his side. Along the way, he married a young woman named Jane Bowen, and the couple had a son and two daughters. Unfortunately, a family wasn't enough cause for Hardin to settle down. One night, while Hardin was staying at a hotel in Abilene, a man named Charles Cougar was snoring loudly in the next room. Hardin pounded on the wall, but the man didn't wake up. To try and wake the man, Wes fired his gun and shot a bullet through the wall. When the snoring stopped and the man made no other sound, Hardin realized he had aimed too low and shot the man dead. However, the incident that solidified John Hardin's place in history came in 1874 on his 21st birthday. Celebrating a big win at the horse races, Hardin and a few companions got incredibly drunk and got into an altercation with Deputy Sheriff Charles Webb. The two got into a duel, and Hardin won. The murderer reportedly enraged the town folks so much that they lynched Hardin's brother and cousins, forcing him to go on the run and a $4,000 bounty to be placed on his head. It took six years for the law to catch up to Hardin. By 1877, he was living under a new name, J.H. Swain, with his family's wife in Pensacola, Florida. A group of Texas Rangers led by John Armstrong had managed to track him down and found him on a passenger train car with a few of his friends. Hardin recognized Armstrong immediately and went to draw his gun, but it caught in his suspenders. One of Hardin's friends fired a shot at Armstrong, blasting the hat right off his head. In response, Armstrong shot the man through his heart. 
According to Encyclopedia Britannica, they took him back to Austin, where he was tried for the murder of Charles Webb and sentenced to 25 years in prison in September 1877. And although he made multiple escape attempts, Hardin also read up on theology and law and even became a superintendent of the prison Sunday school. By 1894, he was apparently reformed into a law-abiding citizen and pardoned for his crimes. Following his pardon, Hardin was admitted to the state bar and left town for El Paso, intending to set up a law practice. Unfortunately, his efforts to lead a decent life didn't quite pan out. In 1895, Hardin was acting as a defense attorney for Martin Mraz, a cattle thief who had fled to Mexico. While working Mraz's case, Hardin took an interest in his client's wife, and soon enough, the two became lovers. Mraz found out about the affair and sought to return to El Paso from Mexico, enlisting the help of lawman George Scarborough to get across. Unfortunately for Mraz, Scarborough double-crossed him and Mraz was gunned down by several lawmen at the border. The rumor was that Hardin had hired the men to assassinate his client before he could get revenge. But on August 19, 1895, one of the lawmen involved in Mraz's murder, John Selman, found Wes Hardin in the Acme Saloon in El Paso and shot him in the back of the head. Some have argued Selman's murder was a result of not being paid for killing Mraz. Others say that Selman and Hardin had been involved in a long and bitter feud. In either case, John Wesley Hardin's life ended that day in the Acme Saloon, but his legacy has lived on. In 1876, Stephen D. Richards left his home and his family in Ohio to go west in hopes of finding wealth, and within two weeks of arriving in Nebraska, he would commit his first murder, with eight more to follow. This would go on to give him the title as the first serial killer in Nebraska. Born in 1856 in West Virginia, his family would move multiple times throughout Ohio before settling in Mount Pleasant, a Quaker village. Until the age of 20, Richards lived with his parents, working on various farms. He would eventually become engaged to a woman named Anna Milhorn, but it appears that they never married. They would, however, remain in usual correspondence to each other up until his final arrest. In 1876, Richards decided to go westward to find fame and fortune. He first lived in Iowa, where he would work as a farmhand for a while. He then took a position at the Iowa Lunatic Asylum, where his job was to bury deceased patients. Richards recalled later that he would watch people die and not feel a thing. After leaving the asylum, he fell into a life of crime. After arriving in Kearney, Nebraska, he killed his first victim within two weeks. After meeting a man in the countryside of Nebraska, the two played cards in smaller towns, where Richards took almost every cent the other man possessed. A short time later, the two men set off for Kearney after a night of playing cards, and the man demanded his money back from Richards. When he refused, he stabbed the man to death and dumped his body in a river. A few days later, he would also kill one of the man's friends, fearing that he could connect him to the murder. His third killing came when he bought a horse and buggy with counterfeit money. When the seller realized this, he tracked down Richards and demanded either real money or the return of his horse and buggy. Richards shot the man in the head, then buried him after the man threatened to contact the police. In March of 1877, he killed another man, this time for waking him up too early. The man woke Richards up at 3 a.m. and Richards shot him after having an argument. In June 1878, Richards was in jail for larceny and reunited with a woman he'd met named Mary Harrelson. The pair met when he was traveling after his first murders. Harrelson's husband was a well-known train robber and she herself was in jail for aiding in the escape of prisoners. They made an agreement that he would buy the deed to her land for $600. In October of the same year, he moved into the Harrelson's homestead and would eventually marry her. Then in November, worried his wife's talkative nature would expose his crimes, Richards hacked her and her children to death with an axe, leaving a bloody mess of limbs and gore in the Harrelson residence. They were found on December 11th. 
Using one of the many aliases he'd acquired over the years, Richards, who called himself Dick Richardson, began working at one Peter Anderson's farm. Shortly after he was hired at the farm, Anderson got violently ill after eating a meal Richards had prepared for him. He expressed this concern to a neighbor, who likely told him to confront the man, and this could very well be why the two eventually got into an altercation in which Richards beat the man to death with a hammer. He fled after neighbors began asking questions about Anderson's absence, and there was soon a $200 bounty for information on his whereabouts. He traveled by horse, train, and foot through Omaha, Chicago, and other places on his way back to Mount Pleasant. He eventually met up with Jasper Harrelson and his fellow escapee. The three men traveled through numerous states together before arriving in Richard's hometown, where he would soon be apprehended. After his arrest, he was jailed in Steubenville, Ohio, and wrote two articles for local papers, confessing to nine killings over a span of three years. He was eventually taken back to Nebraska by two county sheriffs that tracked him down to Ohio. Richard's trial began in January 1879 and was charged on two counts of first-degree murder. Only after two hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty, and he was set to be executed by hanging on April 26, 1879. Spectators at his execution were rumored to have been between 2,000 and 25,000 people. At 1 p.m., he was walked to the gallows and spoke about how he was wrongly convicted and ready to meet Christ. At 1.17, he was hanged. The St. Louis Globe Democrat claimed it took 15 minutes for him to die. After his death, Richard's body was stolen the night after his execution, but it was later returned. But after it was buried, it would be dug up again and his bones were spread across the streets of Kearney. The Kearney County Gazette reported that they had obtained his skull in October 1882, proudly displaying it in their office window. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking around. If you enjoyed this content, leave a like, comment, and share this video. And if you're a fan of the channel, consider becoming a member. It comes with some really cool perks. I also post sneak peeks of upcoming videos in our community tab. Stay safe out there.